Hey folks, I'm really excited for today's episode because we're gonna make a new type of figure using a geome I have never used before, geome raster. We'll also combine that with facet grid uh, so that we can make what's called a small multiples plot of global climate change across the earth between 1950 and 2021. My inspiration is coming from this figure that you'll see from the Climate Lab book uh, made by our friend Ed Hawkins. Uh, he goes from 1850s up to 2019. Uh, each row is a different decade and each column then is a different year in that decade. There's a lot going on in this visual. So thankfully they've provided us with um, you know, a blown up version. Um, one of the things that I noticed and that people that commented on this figure noticed down below in their comments is that there's a lot of patchiness to the data. And you'll notice that you'll kind of see um, temperatures perhaps where there were shipping lanes, right? Um, uh, in the 1850s going forward. What we noticed in the last episode when we plotted uh, the, the degrees latitude and longitude that we had data for each year from 1880 up to the current is that we saw a big shift in the number of observations um, per year uh, right around uh, the 1950s. And so what I wanna to do today is look at the global distribution of uh, temperature anomalies from 1950 coming forward. Now, this image is an example of a rastered image in which each pixel is indicated by a different color and that color uh, comes to us from the temperature anomaly data. Um, I don't think they've got it in here, at least I can't see it when I zoom in myself, um, but you could imagine having a globe um, underneath the, the colored images so that you could actually see where these different temperature anomalies are. It's really hard to see looking at this map, you know, what part of the Earth am I actually looking at? NASA actually made an animation, which I'm showing now, um, showing over the decades uh, temperature anomalies on top of the Earth. And so I think that works well because it's large enough that you can see the outlines of the continents and countries with the temperature anomalies on top. These images, these little thumbnails, if you will, are so small that it's really hard to see that level of detail. What I'm gonna do with my version of this figure is instead of plotting all temperature anomalies over water and uh, land, is I'm only gonna look at the land-based temperature anomalies. I think what that will allow me to do then is to basically see the outlines of the continents. Um, you know, I would leave it to you to go back and get the other data set that also includes the temperature anomalies over uh, the oceans. So heading over to our studio here, uh, if you want to get a copy of the code and the data and everything that I've been working on over this series of episodes, down below in the description, there's a link to a blog post that has all the coordinates on GitHub that you need to get uh, yourself set up. Great. So I'm going to build off of the code that we used last time to build those ridgeline plots. You'll recall um, that we got the data from a net CDF um, formatted data set from the NASA website. Again, go back and look at that episode if you want to learn all the intricacies of how we got that new uh, binary formatted data into um, our studio and got it to be tidy. I'm going to go ahead and copy from that ridgeline.r uh, script maybe the first, oh, say, um, I think the first 43 lines here. So I'm going to go ahead and copy all that and I'm gonna paste it into an empty R script that I'm calling globaltempanomaly.r. I'll save that. Um, and I'm gonna look through the different libraries that I've got loaded here. Um, I don't need GG ridges because I'm not gonna make a ridgeline plot. So that should be good. I'm gonna go ahead and highlight everything and run it so I have everything loaded here in my R session. Very good, that is all loaded. That leaves us with this data frame tData so looking at the data frame, we see that we've got year, longitude, latitude, T diff. We also have a T av column. Um, so what I'm envisioning here then is a different panel for each year from 1950 forward. We've got the longitude and the latitude. We're gonna plot as color uh, the T diff variable. The T av was the global average temperature for each year. I don't need that. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove that um, also, I noticed that my output here is grouped by year, so we don't need that either. So I'll go ahead and remove that. And again, now if I look at T data, I see the columns that I'm interested in. So let's go ahead and start to make our plot. So we'll take T data, and I'm going to focus in on a single year before I build out all 72 years. So let's do filter year equals equals 2000. 
Uh, this then gets us the latitude longitude uh, t difference for uh, the year 2000. So we can then feed this into ggplot AES. Our x will be the longitude, our y will be the latitude, and then our fill, uh, I gotta spell that right, our fill will be t diff. And again, that's gonna be the color of the raster. And so we'll then feed this into a new geom, for me at least, which is geom raster. Um, and again, geom raster takes uh, fill as the argument for the color rather than color. Very good. We can see those land masses uh, indicated by those colors. Again, if we wanted all of uh, the ocean and the land masses, there's another data set up on the GISS website that we looked at briefly um, in the last episode. You could get that, but then it makes it harder to see the land masses. And again, at the size that each of these panels will be in the final image, I don't think we would see a plot of the map of the Earth um, behind this or on top of it, right? I just don't think that's going to work very well. Um, it's just not going to be you know, high enough resolution. So I'm happy to run with the landmass image. So there's a few changes that I want to make to this individual panel before I explode things and do 72 or so different panels. So the first thing I want to do is to alter the, the fill coloring, the gradient. Um, the other thing that I want to do is work on our axes. Um, and then the third thing I want to do is set the color for the background. So let's start with the gradient for the fill. So we'll do scale fill gradient two. We've seen this a lot already. Um, and as always, we'll do low equals dark red. Um, mid is going to be white. High uh, will be uh, dark blue, dark red, actually. Um, so I don't know. The defaults for low is dark red and the max or high is dark blue. Uh, but I want the opposite, right? right? Because blue is a cold color and red is a hot color, right? So we'll go ahead and do that. And then we'll do midpoint equals zero. We can see our red being for hot and blue being for cooler relative to an average temperature anomaly at each two degree by two degree spot between the years 1951 and 1980. So very good. Um, the next thing that I want to move on to is setting our um, axes, right? And so we're looking at latitude and longitude where one degree of longitude is the same as one degree of latitude. So I want to make sure that those proportions are always one to one. I can achieve that using chord fixed. And so now this gives me a dimension that is much more in fitting with uh, the shape of the earth. One other thing I'm noticing is that we have a bit of a margin as we always see with plots from ggplot2. There's always a bit of a space or expansion around the figure. You'll notice that this uh, basically bar for Antarctica is lifted up off the bottom. We can turn that off with the expansion. So we can do expand equals false. And so now we see that we've got much tighter um, edges on our map. And so that looks pretty good. I also want to go ahead and remove our um, labels on the X and Y. I think people will know that these are longitude and latitude. Um, I don't need extra text in here to kind of cloud up the story. So I'll do labs. Uh, with x equals null, y equals null. Uh, maybe later we'll go ahead and put in a ma main title, but I'm happy with this for now. I'm also going to go ahead and turn off uh, the axis labels and uh, axis text and ticks. So we'll do that with theme, uh, and then we'll do axis.text equals element blank, and then axis.ticks equals element blank. And I forgot a comma here, so I'll get that. And so now we have a pretty trimmed down version of the figure. Um, I'm gonna leave the legend in here for now. Uh, we'll go back and modify that later when we've got the full figure. The final thing I wanna do before we blow this up and um, make our you know um, small multiples version of the figure is to turn the background to be black. I think if we make it black, that will really help the whites to pop and the distinction between the colors be more clear. And so I'm gonna go ahead and do panel.background equals element rect fill equals black. And then the same thing with the plot.background element rect fill equals black. And then we also wanna remove the grid lines, right? So we'll do panel.grid equals element blank. Very good, we're well on our way. So now what I wanna do is to expand this to all of the years between 1950 and 2021, which is the last year that we have the full data for. 
So I'm going to go ahead and comment out my filter where I was just looking at the year 2000. And I'm going to come down, so we'll add facet wrap, and we're going to do tilde year. And so what that means is make a different small plot or a different panel uh, for each year. So for each year, we'll get a different plot just like what we had for the year 2000. I'm going to then say n call equals 10 uh, because I want the 10 years uh, across. And then I'll do n row equals 8 because, again, we have, I think it was 72 years. And so we'll have um, 10 columns, 8 rows, and there'll be a few slots in there that should be open. I'll go ahead and add this into the overall ggplot pipeline. Very good. We have our 72 different plots here. Um, unfortunately, you can't see anything uh, because the screen is very small, but also the heading, the label for each of the facets really dominates the individual panel. So I'd like to remove that. And so I'm thinking ahead about how I want this figure to look. And what I'd like to have is in the left-hand margin, I want the decade label, kind of like we saw in the version from the University of Reading. Um, I'm not going to put a year across the columns because I think that'll be obvious, I hope. Um, and so one of the things that we could do is instead of using facet wrap, we could use facet grid. And so facet grid works well when you basically have a matrix of plots where you've got one variable on the x-axis and one variable on the y-axis. And so what I'm going to put on my y-axis is my decade and on the x-axis will be the year. I can then remove those labels and do something special with them that I'll show you. So I need to make those two columns. So we'll come back up here to T data and I'll go ahead then and do a mutate. And so we'll do a decade. Um, and so for the decade, we'll have something like 1962 and I want that to be 1960, right? And so what I can do is I can divide the year by 10, right? So that 1962, would be 196.2. And then I can do a floor on that. So floor on that. And maybe I'll come down here and show this in the, in the console what I'm going for, right? So if I do floor 1962 divided by 10, I should get 196. And sure enough, I do. And if I then multiply that by 10, I get the decade, right? And so that is the strategy I'm gonna use here. So we'll go ahead and do 10 times the floor of the year uh, divided by the 10. And so again, if I do T data, I get uh, the decade along with the year. And if I take T data and pipe that to tail, I should get 2020 for 2021. And sure enough, I get the right decade. Now what I want will be the year, okay? And so what I'll do here for the year uh, is something uh, pretty cool. Um, and so I'll take the year and I'll do uh, percent percent 10 and so that percent operator is the modulus operator. If you remember back to elementary school when you were learning long division, you'd have remainders. Well, the modulus is the remainder, right? So if I have 2021 modulus modulus uh, 10, the result should be one, right? And that's what we get. And in fact, if I take, um, let's do 2020 to 2030, right? That vector of numbers, percent percent 10, I then see the year within the decade. So looking at the output, I've got a column for the year, the longitude, latitude, T diff, and the decade. I've noticed that it turned the year like 1953 into, uh, it would be like three in that case, right? Or the, um, in this case, 1950 became zero. And so what I'd like to do is perhaps call this something else so I can keep the year column just in case I need it down the road. So here I'll do single instead of year, T data. I now see I've got the original four digit year, the decade and single, and we're in good shape. Now, when I come down to my ggplot pipeline, I can do uh, facet grid. And I can, again, use this tilde notation to put decade on the um, y-axis and then single on the x-axis. I can go ahead and remove the n call and the n row. And so now what you see is something a bit different in how these are being labeled, right? And so on the right side, we have the decade, um, but it's so small that it's getting truncated. And across the columns, we have that single year, right? So like this would be 1950, 1951, 52, and so forth, right? Now what I wanna do is go ahead and remove these labels um, across the x-axis, because I don't, I don't need to say that, you know, what individual year that is. And on the rows, um, I've got those decades that I'd like to be on the left side rather than the right side. I'd also like to turn them 90 degrees, 
so that they're horizontal to the x-axis. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. So the first thing I want to do is go ahead and move the label from the right side to the left side. And so we can do that up here in Facet Grid, where I will do switch equals Y. Again, that'll take Y uh, to the left side. And so now I've got those years on the left side. And now I can use the theme function to go ahead and get rid of those labels across the top. And to do that, we'll do strip text.x equals element blank. That gets rid of those labels across the top. And then I can also do strip.text.y equals element text. And then we'll do angle equals zero. So nothing happened. And I think what happened is that it is still expecting that this strip is on the right side. And so there's an argument strip text y right and left. And so I think what we'd rather have here is dot left. I'm not sure why things don't always cascade down like they're supposed to uh, through these different levels. Um, but I think what we want is left. And so there we now see that we've got the decade on the left and it is parallel to the X axis. Awesome. Now what I want to do is go ahead and remove the background from the strip. We've got that gray color and I also need to make the text white. So in here for the strip text Y left, we'll do color equals white and then strip dot background. Uh, we'll do element blank. We now see that we've got our decades properly labeled um, and it looks pretty good. Of course, what we have down here in the lower right corner of our studio is way too small to see anything. What I'd like to do is output this using ggsave to a PNG that's gonna be quite large. So we'll do ggsave figures um, global anomaly dot PNG width equals 10 height equals 4.5 and then unit uh, units equals inches. Very good. I like this um, aspect ratio. I think it looks pretty good. Um, one thing that I keep noticing and forgetting is this white border around the plot. And so we'll modify plot background to also have color equals black uh, to get rid of that white border. Good. We're making progress, aren't we? So one thing I noticed is that when we went to this faceted version, all of the colors got much more muted, right? And so if I look at my legend, I see we're going from probably like 13 uh, down to like minus 10, right? And what we've seen before when we made those ridgeline plots is that most of the action happened between plus and minus four, right? So what I think I'll do is modify my T diff column so that if the value is greater than four, I'm gonna make it four. And if it's less than negative four, I'm gonna make it negative four. That way then those extreme temperature anomalies will be that dark red color. And that will then allow us to see, um, have a better um, kind of positioning on our dynamic range of the colors. To do that, let's come back up to our T data. Um, and what we can do here then would be a mutate on T diff. So I'll use a case when. Uh, so a case when is like a more complicated if else statement. So T diff less than um, negative four tilde negative four. So if it's less than negative four, I want it to be negative four. Uh, if T diff is greater than four, I want that to be four. Um, and then otherwise, if true, uh, I want that to be T underscore diff. And make sure I've got all my, I think I've got one too many parentheses here. So we'll then uh, pipe that into ggplot. There we go. Now we have a much bolder set of colors and it's easier to see that you know, in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, um, that the colors are more muted, more close to that zero range. Again, the data were normalized between 1951 and 1980. Um, but then as we move forward, we can definitely see warmer temperatures in the plot. So that's pretty cool. The next thing I wanna do is do something about our legend. It's off here on the right, and it's taking up valuable real estate, I feel. I would rather have it be at the bottom um, where we've got some extra space. So to do that, we can, of course, come back down to our theme function and we can do legend legend dot position equals bottom. And so now we have our legend at the bottom. Um, and I, I was thinking that down in here, this last row was at the bottom. But really, that's part of the plot. We just have blank plots in here. Right. So let's move that up into the window. And to do that, we can instead of using a position like bottom, we can give X and Y positions relative to the overall size of the plot. So I'll do 0 0.75 and zero. And so that gets me a vertical legend there. So what I need then is to add a legend 
dot direction uh, and we'll then say horizontal. Now what I want to do is go ahead and flip the colors, if you will, right? So the white to black and black to white. Uh, again, we can come up into our theme. So we can do legend.text equals element text color equals white. And then we can also do legend.background equals element racked uh, fill equals black. And I see that I have lost my legend title. So we need another argument for that, which will be legend title, uh, making that white. And I think I'd rather have the title be larger than the text. So the text being those numbers across uh, the horizontal. So for the title, I'll do size equals six. Uh, and so for my text, like that negative four, negative two, zero, so forth, I'll make that size equals five, just a small difference. So I'm happy with the way this is turning out. One thing I'd like to do though, is give more to the left of negative four and more to the right of positive four. Again, we do have values beyond uh, those extremes that we're showing. So again, I can come back up into my scale fill gradient and I can do limits uh, and let's do C uh, negative five to five. And then I also wanna keep my breaks uh, of negative four, negative two, zero, two, and four. So to set the title of the legend, I'm gonna use the name argument and we'll do anomaly uh, and then in parentheses degree C with the Unicode U00B0C, close parentheses, quote. Right? So I like that title, I just don't like the position. <laughs> I'd rather have the title of the legend, at least when I'm doing a horizontal like this, be on top of the legend. So we can do that with the guides function. We'll do guides fill equals guide uh, color bar, right? And then into here, we're gonna give a couple different arguments. Title.position equals top. And then we'll also do title.hjust equals 0 0.5. So the title position, we'll put it on top of the guide color bar and the title hjust will center that, right? So zero is left justification, one is right, 0 0.5 is in the middle. That's exactly what I want. So I'm happy with the way that looks. Now what we'll do is go ahead and add a title to our overall figure. So to change the title, I'll come back up here and then do title equals global annual temperature anomalies between uh, 1950 and 2021. And of course, I can't see my title because the default color for a title is black uh, and I've got a black background. So let's come back up here and I will then do plot.title equals element, element text. Uh, color equals white, and then we'll do face uh, equals bold. Um, I am noticing that now that I added that title, it's bumping my legend down a smidge. So I want to raise that legend position. I had it at zero. So let's do like 0 0.05. I'm really happy with the way this turned out. Um, looking at this figure, I think the black does a really nice job of highlighting uh, the change from blue to white to red um, and those differences. One thing I'm noticing is for the early 1950s is that we don't have any data for Antarctica, right? So um, as I mentioned, um, and we saw in the previous episode, the number of observations we had across the globe really increased in the 1950s. And I suspect a lot of that happened here in Antarctica as we kind of, you know, we do have pretty full maps for everything but Antarctica, but that certainly adds something. Anyway, um, I, I think we can totally see the trend. And as you kind of kind of scan down um, you can kind of see this the little panels getting redder and redder something I wondered about would be would we maybe have a better visual if we had the decades across the rows across the columns and the individual years across the rows right so we'd have basically eight columns and ten rows I will leave that to you as an exercise if you come up with that go ahead and tweet that at me um, I would love to see if you get that to work, and if you think that works better than what we have here. Um, if I was doing this for a publication or something like that, or for a presentation, I would probably go ahead and try it with that different orientation. So there's a few things you're gonna have to change along the way from the theming that we set up, but I think you can do it. Keep practicing with these techniques and the various theming uh, tools that we're using and different ways that we're trying to convey stories about certainly something that's very important like climate change. Anyway. Keep practicing, and we'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.